Today, 99% of the 1.4 billion vehicles on the road are gas powered. In 2018 alone, our cars, SUVs, motorcycles, buses, and trucks collectively spewed out more than 6 billion tons of CO2. That was 12.5% of all the greenhouse gas emissions produced that year. 12.5%, which is a lot. But what if tomorrow, miraculously, every vehicle sold was a battery electric vehicle? What impact would that have on global emissions? In this video, we're going to do the math, all of the math, to find out. So here we go. Two columns for you. On the left, all the emissions that come from making and using a gas-powered vehicle with an internal combustion engine, or ICE for short. On the right, all the emissions that come from making and using a battery electric vehicle. The steps in our calculation are going to include the following things. Number one, emissions associated with gathering the raw materials for the vehicle, all associated supply chains, and the actual assembling of those materials into the car. Let's call this the manufacturing step. Number two, the emissions that will be created to produce the energy to run the car. These are called the well to tank emissions because for gas powered vehicles, the fuel that you used to fill your tank was sourced from an oil well. For electric vehicles, the well, quote unquote, is the source of energy to the electric grid, which charges the vehicle's battery, which in turn would be the tank in this well to tank metaphor. And finally, number three, the emissions created during the actual operation of the vehicle. These are called the tank to wheel emissions. Now, to make sure we're producing a fair comparison, we're going to be looking specifically at an average gas-powered passenger car and its electric equivalent. And this is a global average, so you have to imagine a very compact and fuel-efficient four-door sedan. The numbers we're going to show in this video come from the transportation statistics and vehicle life cycle models published by Oak Ridge National Lab and the Argonne National Lab. So let's start with manufacturing. What does it take to make the cars? Here, gas-powered vehicles are the clear winner. About 5.1 tons of CO2 equivalent are emitted during the manufacture of ICE vehicles, compared to 9 tons of CO2 equivalent for electric vehicles. The difference comes because an electric vehicle requires about 40% more steel and 65% more aluminum to build the battery-driven propulsion system, plus the specialized metals that make up the battery itself. The larger amount of raw materials you need results in a proportional increase in emissions produced during the mining and refining of those materials. Andy Stevenson is the former CFO of electric vehicle recycling company Redwood Materials, and he broke down everything that's involved in this step in a conversation with Climate Now. So, you know, starting at the mine, there's typically uh, when you're processing a, a, an ore material, the metal or material that you're targeting is a very, very small percentage by mass of that original ore material. So typically that whole thing goes through a kind of a mechanical size reduction process and then several different types of separation processes to concentrate the metal that you're targeting at a percentage that's higher than it is in the original ore. And then from there, you sort of go into various steps of further refining that and making it into an actual product. So now that our car is built, let's drive it. The emissions we produce are controlled by two factors. First, the car's efficiency. That is, how far can it go on one unit of gas or electric energy? And number two, the total number of miles that the car drives in its lifetime. An average gas-powered passenger car has an efficiency of about 33 miles per gallon. To put that into metric units, you would need 71 milliliters of gasoline to drive one kilometer in your internal combustion car. And the process of pumping, refining, and transporting those 71 milliliters of gas from an underground oil reservoir to your gas tank will result in about 43 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent released. These are your well-to-tank emissions. To drive one kilometer in an electric vehicle will require about 0.17 kilowatt hours of electricity. And given the current global mix of energy sources that are used to provide electricity to the grid, producing that much electricity releases about 130 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent. 
Now, to get to total vehicle well-to-tank emissions, we need to multiply those numbers by how far the car will drive over its lifetime, which is, on average, about 242,000 kilometers. So for a gas-powered vehicle, that results in about 10.4 tons of CO2 emissions. For an electric vehicle, it's about 31.5 tons. I know, I know, it's weird. It looks like the internal combustion engines are winning. And by now, you are starting to trust all of those are EVs really that great headlines that you've read. But Cars with internal combustion engines still have tank-to-wheel emissions. For our average efficiency gas-powered car, what comes out of the tailpipe adds to 37.3 tons of CO2 equivalent emitted over a car's lifetime. For EVs, tank-to-wheel emissions are a big, fat, and wonderful zero. And because of that zero, greenhouse gas emissions from electric vehicles over the lifetime of the car are less than the emissions from gas-powered vehicles. Going electric is the best option, even with higher indirect emissions. You might be thinking right now, but wait, aren't there also cars that run on hydrogen? What about those? It turns out that emissions-wise, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles have almost the same efficiency as electric vehicles, but they are way, way more expensive today. So hydrogen probably will not be a leading solution for passenger vehicles anytime soon, Although that story might be different for freight trucks and other hard to decarbonize industries. You can find out more in our video exploring the potential of hydrogen fuel cell technology. Let's go back to the results of our calculation. Now, when our goal is to reach a global economy that is producing net zero emissions by the year 2050, the idea that going electric only produces a 20% decline in the global emissions from passenger vehicles is a little disheartening. But that 20% is not actually the end of this story. You will recall that one of the inputs to our calculation was the carbon intensity of the electricity grid, a measure of how much CO2 is emitted by the use of the current global mix of energy sources to power the grid. Now that mix includes a lot of coal and a lot of natural gas. Renewable sources like wind and solar and hydropower make up only 12% of global electricity production, but that number is growing fast. The International Energy Agency estimates that with just the implementation of existing climate policies and pledges, by mid-century, well-to-tank vehicle emissions of electric cars will decrease by nearly half. Once we build a grid that is sourced almost entirely from renewable energy, we are looking at a nearly 90% improvement in average vehicle emissions by going electric, with gas-powered vehicles producing 50.8 tons of CO2 equivalent over their lifetime versus a mere 5.9 tons from electric vehicles. And we can bring those emissions down even more by recycling what is left of your EV when it's time to retire it from the road. The EV recycling industry is still in its infancy, but including recycling into the manufacturing supply chain could further decrease manufacturing emissions by as much as a third by reducing the need to mine and process more raw materials. Recycling has other co-benefits as well. People are now viewing recycling as a critical way to address potential supply constraints for raw materials for batteries. At the time we started, it was more like, hey, we're solving this problem. We're solving this potential environmental problem of like the disposal of the batteries. But of course, there's all the raw materials that went into making the batteries are still in there. And so if you can actually leverage those as a source of new raw materials, you might be able to have a real meaningful impact on the cost of batteries themselves. Now, there is one other lever that we should pull to decarbonize road transportation with EVs, which is getting them on the road as quickly as possible. This is because the average car on the road today is 12 years old. That means that even if tomorrow, every new car sold were electric, it would still take about 25 years to fully replace the global fleet of almost entirely gas-powered vehicles with electric ones. And we are far from 100% electric vehicle sales today. In 2019, only 1.8% of all new car sales were battery electric vehicles, and that number was 14% higher than the previous year. If the market share of EVs continues to grow by 14% annually, new car sales will be 100% electric by 2050, but only 45% of the cars on the road would actually be electric. If we want the global fleet to be entirely electric by 2050, 100% of new car sales must be electric by 2030. So what are the chances that this will just ramp up and happen on its own because EVs are so fun to drive and people care about climate change? Very slim. 
The bottom line is that in 2021, the average price for a new or used electric vehicle was about 10,000 US dollars more than the industry average. So even though over a vehicle's lifetime, EVs are a money saver relative to their gas powered counterparts, the high upfront cost has been a major barrier to EV growth in low income communities and nations. To a degree, this problem is already improving as battery prices decline and manufacturing costs start to break even between EVs and gas-powered cars, which will probably happen by 2024. But EV companies will also need to adjust their marketing approach, as Nathan Ratledge, Tomcat Center graduate fellow in sustainable energy at Stanford University, explained to us. You know, we've seen a lot of electric vehicle growth in, in the US, in Europe, uh, China, but all those products were designed for those markets, right? So like. Um, $100,000 Tesla doesn't really sell well in a low-income country. And so a big thing that we talk about a lot is just not that you have to retweak the technology, but that you need to like just change the product design just slightly to fit the consumer needs. Low-income countries where the main form of transport is a rickshaw or motorcycle have a huge market growth opportunity. EV companies should develop products built for these countries. In addition to just getting more affordable electric vehicles to market, there is plenty that policymakers can do to incentivize EV adoption. First, mandates work, requiring car companies to systematically reduce total average fleet emissions or sell a certain number of zero emissions vehicles directly increases the share of EVs. Second, public transit needs to go electric. Buses, taxis, and ride-sharing vehicles travel way more miles annually than personal cars, and so will have a larger impact on emissions reductions when they go electric. Additionally, adoption of EVs in public transit demonstrates the technology to hesitant buyers, and manufacturing fleets of public vehicles can initiate economies of scale that bring down the cost for everyone. Third, invest in public charging infrastructure. In 2018, 90% of EV chargers were private home chargers. This won't work for residents of apartment buildings and condos. The United States alone will need about 2.4 million public and workplace charging stations by 2030, up from a little over 200,000 today. That is going to take about $28 billion of investment. Fourth, and we keep saying this on Climate Now, a national price on carbon incentivizes drivers to leave their gas guzzling cars. Norway, for example, has a price on carbon and taxes internal combustion vehicles. They also lead the world in electric vehicle share of new car sales at 65% in 2021. Finally, make the upfront costs less onerous. This can be done through waived import taxes and other tax incentives like rebates or instituting a low interest rate policy for car loans. I think a big thing is, and you've seen this in the solar home system and microgrid space, is reducing import duties. So um, right now, if you bring a new vehicle into many countries, your tax is quite high and that creates higher real cost, right? That's a big thing. Um, two is incentivizing it. Financial incentives are huge for people, right? I mean, we've seen this happen a lot in the renewable energy space. I think that's really key. Um, but the third thing is, is I think that, you know, the governments need to think about uh, how they can help finance the deployment of these vehicles. You know, interest rates in a lot of the parts of the world are traditionally high across the whole country, right? And so, if that's the case, then your vehicle loans are probably going to be pretty steep too. A lot of that, I would argue, is a bit of a hangover in Western perspective. Um, if what you see what fintech companies are doing and what the solar home system companies have figured out is that you can offer lower interest rates. And if people value the product, like guess what? They're going to pay off that interest because they really want to keep the product, right? So what is the takeaway of all of this? Well, for road transportation, we need to go electric. And we need to do it quickly. And doing so will make a meaningful dent in global greenhouse gas emissions, as long as we are building a carbon-free electrical grid at the same time. Luckily, we have some good ideas on how to do that. You can check out our videos and podcast conversations on wind energy, carbon capture and storage, nuclear power, and more, as well as our ongoing podcast series on decarbonizing transportation at climatenow.com. And click subscribe to catch our latest episodes. Thank you so much and hope to see you next time.